Hey biggies and welcome back to another episode of the Beer Stash, the episodes of the Craft Beer Channel where I am cracking all the stuff I didn't have the guts to crack until I thought the world was ending. So I've been cracking some incredible stuff over the last couple of weeks and in an effort to get some more voices in there so it's not just me in lockdown, not quite in my pants but let's be honest I put these on just before I started filming. Um, I wanted to get some other voices in, some other people, and so I've been interviewing wherever I can the head brewers, the founders, whoever it is, of the particular brewery of the beer that I'm drinking that day. And that's been working really, really well. Now, the beer I'm actually going to have today is not from my stash, because when I contacted Brett, who's the head brewer and co-founder of Wild Beer Co., about doing a video together, he said, don't do that beer man, because he actually just brewed the next year's edition. So he sent me the more up-to-date version, and that's what I'll be drinking in today's episode, which is all about Cool Ship from Wild Beer Co. So Cool Ship is Wild Beer's interpretation of the Lambic tradition, and as you'll find out when we chat to Brett, he doesn't actually put that much stall by the tradition of it. He's more interested just in the spontaneous nature, so not adding any yeast himself, just letting yeast from the air um, and bacteria and yeast from the barrels he's using to ferment that liquid. And all that is just to try and create a beer that has a taste of the region in which they're brewing, which is Somerset in the southwest of England. So while there are sort of traces, threads you could pull from Lambic production, actually their processes are incredibly different. Before we do join him, I will just say that if you find what he says fascinating, most Fridays at the moment, Wild Beer Co. are tasting through new releases. Uh, so you can find out the details on the website. I believe this very Friday they'll be tasting 2020, and next Friday they're going to be tasting Bats Valley, which was... It's one of my beers of the year so far, a beautiful citra, dry hopped wild ale. It's absolutely stellar and we have a discount code live uh, for the next couple of days just down in the descriptions box where you can get that at a discount unless you're watching on Dave. Anyway, let's hear what Brett had to say and I start by asking him kind of why he'd want to do such a long, complicated, expensive and intense project as a Cool Ship beer. Why we wanted to do a project like Cool Ship was the story of why we wanted to set up the brewery. Um, I say that we set the brewery up so that we could discover how to make modus operandi. I know that's a different beer that we make and I won't go on about it. Um, um, thank you for enjoying it, Johnny, on some of your conversations that you've been having with people. Um, but why I say we set the brewery up to discover that beer is because I knew how to make it theoretically. I've made sour brown ales at home. I knew that when I execute it on a big scale, it would work, but I, we don't know what it's really actually, the nuts and bolts, the nuances of it, it's gonna taste like. We set out to do it because we wanted to know what beer tastes like in our area. How did you, did you, I assume you use a cool ship, given that you've called, called it a cool ship? Yeah, well, I can actually ask James, he could wheel one over. Um, because our cool ships are on wheels. Uh, and they Eat more than one cool ship. Yes, <laughs> just like shopping trolleys with beer in. They are. They've got oh, like yeah. <laughs> they're not shopping trolleys, but they're like no, that wouldn't hold the water very well. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, why have you got multiple cool ships? Uh, they're just small. Um, they're just too small, and we had access to two. Um, so we, our landlords, um, are dairy farmers. And, and they have a dairy on site that turns their, their um, dairy cow milk into amazing artisanal cheddar. Um, and in making cheddar, you've got these long, uh, shallow vats called cooling tables, uh, which they do the same version of a cool ship. They, it's not intended to inoculate. They're not trying to, they're actually trying to keep things away, but, um, they put all their curds in there and they let it cool down um, in a matter of hours. It's relatively quick for them. Um, but they've had, they had these two mobile cooling tables that they didn't use um, and we, we got them. When it comes to the, the blending, um, what sort of things are you looking for? Are you trying to produce something completely different from, from those Belgian ones that have inspired you? Or are you looking for similar characteristics but you know, expressed in the the wild beer of the Somerset way. Yeah, 
first of all, I'm just, I'm just super pleased about this blend. It, it gets me really excited. Um, uh, it's incredibly drinkable. So we're looking for quite a drinkable beer. Um, in blending, um, we're, I, I'm looking for, I don't know how, I've always described it as this aroma that's very particular to goose and um, real native beer. Um, and I call it a, a dead ant smell. And in, in California, we've got lots of ants that come into the kitchen and you gotta always clean really well because you've got ants everywhere, at least in the Central Valley where I grew up. And as a little kid, if you, as you're cleaning them up, you could also like smell this, I think it's formic acids, smell this aroma coming out. And chefs use dead ants to give like a, a lemony zesty type character um you see this in like noma and like these are kind of like cutting edge chefs you know and they're super expensive um, everyone else is just using a lemon yeah <laughs> like uh, let's have some guacamole with dead ants in it squeezing you know? <laughs> of ants little milking um yeah, no, yeah. The, so i but i smell these these things i smelt it in like the original uh producers of Lambic and then I was smelling it in like Firestone Walker beers and um, I don't get it as much in Vinny, Vinny's beers but I do at Russian River um, I do on memory I don't but um, but it was always in, in printed there and, and I get so excited when I can smell that um, it, it just means like in, you got signposts of it but anyways that's one aspect um, but we're looking to blend a drinkable beer I think lots of Cool ship, um, wild lambic type beer when you buy it from a traditional source, from a traditional maker, it's always surprising how drinkable it is. Mm -hmm. It's not rip your face off sour. I look at blending as um, two things. One, it's a crazy like hunt for the needle in the haystack because we've got 500 oak barrels and that's not all cool ship. Uh, so with Cool Ship, we maybe have maybe 50 oak barrels. I don't, I don't think we have that many. Um, I, I think it, it's probably more like 30. I should have done that research before this. Sorry. Um, uh, but, uh, but for some, so for like modus operandi, we find to make that beer consistent, we need to have a barrel library of about 100 oak barrels so that we can reject some, accept some younger ones, use some older ones, and then still have some three months from now to blend another one. And, and you have that variety to play with. Um, and so with this one, we haven't found that, like how big the haystack needs to be um, to find it. And then having the team, getting the team to blend together and regularly, I guess, has been really important. Because if we were gonna blend something, Johnny, like the first one or four or five times, we're gonna be getting to know how each other describes beer. Like when I say it's like, I don't know, musty or fausty or mousy, like to you that could mean- Or dead empty. Well, dead empty, yeah, yeah, exactly. And everybody's like, who's ant died? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's a learning process for the people there. I also love the way you describe that as a needle in a haystack, because I guess you're sitting down with, say, 30 barrels, and independently, all of them, like some of them might be delicious, but lots of them will be like really acetic, and you'll only use that for seasoning or might reject it completely. Yeah. But you sit down with these 30 barrels and go, somewhere in here is probably a world class beer, but how the fuck do we go about finding that? Yeah, yeah. So I hope that was interesting. I think once Brett got going, he's really uh, poetic and insightful about the process of blending, which is, you know, we talk a lot about whether brewing is a science or an art. You know, blending is, is all art. It's very rare to see a brewer, you know, look at the chemical com composition of a beer and blend it that way. It's all down to palates, which is maybe why having more barrels and more people is helpful. So let's get this beer out into a glass, as they say, in beer tube nomenclature. Um, I don't quite know how easy this is gonna be. Right, so, 
Here we go. I can smell it. It smells beautiful from here. Looks absolutely stunning as well. Very happy with that. Soft haze, lovely tight head, and a beautiful golden colour. Looks good. So there's an absolute ton of Brett. I'm not going to make a joke about Brett's name. I'm just going to let you guys sit there and chuckle at all the variations there would be. But there's Brett all over this. A nice uh, sherbetty, real lemon. I don't know whether it's the, the you say, formic acid, the dead ant kind of aroma, but lots of lemon. Funky lemon, preserved lemon, kind of salinity almost. And then lots of oak, which I'm surprised at because he said some of it's aged in food is rather than barrels. So you've got less contact with the wood, but there's loads of oak here. That's a wonderful beer. Loads and loads of really spicy pepper and lemon. It's really fresh and inviting and spicy. The bread is actually really soft on the palate. There's a kind of honeyed candied lemon thing that's softening out that really dry funk. It's got the perception of being sweet, but it's got a really dry finish. There's a really lemon rind or orange rind kind of thing going on, which I think potentially comes from hops. So that's pretty unusual in a spontaneous blend. Usually you just have the hops in there to make sure the right bacteria can survive um, and to add some of that kind of stale oxidized flavor that you might want in a Lambic. Um, here, Brett was saying when we were chatting that he couldn't get hold of aged hops. You know, aged hops are pretty hard to come by because why would you age hops for three, four, five years? So they had to age their own and they were using whatever varieties they could pick up and aging them or trying to accelerate the aging process. And I think possibly there's still more alpha added, more bitterness and more of that oxidized marmalade kind of thing you get from um, old hops or oxidation, whether it's in the beer or not, that's left a really nice, rich citrus to this beer that I don't experience in most Lambics. In terms of the fact that he said because they don't have the ability to do a turbid mash, which is a long-winded mashing process they use in traditional Lambic, where they superheat certain portions of it, put it back in, almost like a decoction. There's a, you know, a lineage there. Uh, they're unable to do that, so they had to use menaloidin malts, like these malts that have gone through a caramelization process to try and create uh, those flavors, those long-chain sugars that the Brett would slowly eat over years in barrel. It's just the, the, the malt character is, is bang on a Lambic. Maybe a tiny bit more caramelized, maybe just a little bit more. But you've then got that lemon, that pepper, that sherbet, that brett, that cider character. And on top of that, you've then got this lovely orangey citric thing. Um, or lemony thing, maybe, maybe it's the dead ant thing that uh, the brett was talking about. But it's a really complex, really fresh beer. I, I was blown away by Bats Valley as well. I think maybe Wild Beer Coast, their barrels are coming of age, both in terms of the, the liquid that's coming out and in terms of the number of barrels that they have, they're managing to hit that sweet spot. Uh, I'm very excited to try more of these, you know, these mixed firm and these spontaneous beers from Wild. I don't think they've ever been making better beer than they are right now when it comes to that format. Um, now that I've had the 2020, I don't even want to touch that. Brett was saying it's very rare, so maybe I should save it now. Um, and, and really make it a special treat for, for me or for Brad on a special occasion. Even if it's not as good, the occasion will, will carry it and will feel special because of its rarity. Um, so yeah, do join them on most Fridays if you can. Brett is a very interesting man to listen to, to talk about, to talk about beers, and that's most Fridays. And obviously our shows on Saturdays, maybe we'll have Wild Beer Co. on soon. Cheers, guys. Mm -hmm.